Welcome to the newest episode of Beatin' and Bangin'. I'm your host, Kyle Dalton. TGIF. In today's video, we're going to talk about multiple news items that have developed in the latter half of the week, including NASCAR's big decision and the penalty of Austin Dillon and the other punishment they handed down on Wednesday to both Dylan Spotter and Joey Logano for what he did on pit road after the race. Plus, we'll also talk about a couple of other items from Richmond, one of them related to the last lap incidents and another that Joe Gibbs racing fans will definitely want to pay attention to. However, before we get to those items, let's go back to Wednesday and the news about Kurt Busch. I'm not sure if you saw it, but according to the Iredell Free News, Bush was arrested late Tuesday evening after he was clocked going 63 miles an hour in a 45 mile per hour zone. According to court documents, the deputy reported Bush had red glassy eyes and a strong odor of alcohol coming from his breath. Court records indicated Bush admitted to drinking prior to driving. He took a blood alcohol content test and had a blood alcohol concentration of 0.17% which is considerably higher than the legal limit in North Carolina of 0.08%. He was taken to the Iredell County Detention Center and released early morning with a signed commitment to appear in court on September 19th. On Wednesday, the 2004 Cup champion released a statement apologizing for the incident. Quote, I'm very disappointed in myself and I apologize to my family, my racing family, and my fans. I will work with the authorities to rectify the situation and work with the county to make it a safer place in the future. End quote. Unfortunately, this isn't the first time for Bush when it comes to drinking and driving. He was also cited for reckless driving after being pulled over on a suspicion of DUI in Arizona back in November of 2005. He was ordered then to complete 50 hours of community service. I know for me, I have really strong feelings when it comes to drunk driving because it personally affected my family years ago when my 19-year-old sister and two others were killed by a drunk driver. So this kind of stuff really hits close to home. And in this day and age where you have Uber, there's really just no excuse to get behind the wheel after drinking. All I hope is that Kurt serves out whatever punishment is handed down by the court and more importantly, he makes better choices in the future. Moving on to our next story, and it's something that I touched on in Monday's race recap video when I talked about the frustration of Martin Truex Jr. after his engine blew up. I mentioned how there have been multiple issues this year with JGR engines. The first one occurred at Gateway when Christopher Bell had a race-winning car and led 80 laps but faded at the end when his engine started blowing up. A week later, it was Denny Hamlin's turn at Sonoma when he blew an engine but just a couple of laps into the race. Then, on July 14th at Pocono, Ty Gibbs, who started on the pole, suffered a similar engine failure. Two times may be a coincidence. Three times we start to see a pattern. Four times is definitely a trend. So this week, TRD General Manager Tyler Gibbs, no relation to Ty Gibbs or the Gibbs family, addressed the subject with Kelly Crandall at Racer.com. Quote, if we didn't beforehand, we certainly now have a concern with our valve springs. The root cause seems to be inconsistency in the quality of our valve springs. We are closely working with our suppliers to correct these issues. We sent a TRD fire team from our Costa Mesa engine shop to make tuning updates to all of our engines heading to Michigan this weekend. We are confident that this remediation step will give us the durability margin we need. Our team partners, including our drivers, remain tremendously supportive. Our goal and expectation each year is perfect engine reliability. We had only one failure in 2023. TRD takes full accountability for the issues we have had this year, and we have fallen far short of what is acceptable. We will not rest until we regain our form and rest assured we will. End quote. I know it's TRD and Toyota, but to me, it just seems odd that it's not anybody but the JGR cars. No one's been affected at 2311. No one's been affected at Legacy Motor Club. So part of me wonders, are they receiving different engine configurations? Are they doing something different? It's just really odd that it's all JGR cars. I will definitely be keeping an eye on this to see if anything happens in the future. Now, let's move on to the main topic of conversation this week, the water cooler talk, and that's what happened at the end of the race at Richmond. As you all know by now, Austin Dillon was penalized this week by NASCAR, 
and the sanctioning body dropped the hammer, not taking away his win, but taking away everything that comes with it, including the points that would count toward eligibility for the Cup Series playoffs. According to NASCAR, after a full review of footage and data, officials ruled Dillon's victory would stand, but his automatic berth in the 16-driver postseason field would be voided for violating the NASCAR rulebook, and specifically Section 12.3.2.1.B. Yeah, I know, it's a lot. Which deals with playoff eligibility and states, quote, race finishes must be unencumbered by violations of the NASCAR rules or other actions detrimental to stock car auto racing or NASCAR as determined in the sole discretion of NASCAR, end quote. Dillon and his number three team were docked 25 points in both the driver's and owner's standings, which dropped him from 26th to 31st in the former rankings. Now, first of all, I completely agree with the decision. In fact, if you heard my Wednesday video before the decision came down, I was fairly confident they weren't going to do anything to Dillon based on past precedents. So they pleasantly surprised me, stepped up, and made what I know was a tough call, and hopefully sent a message to the garage that this type of behavior is not going to be acceptable in the future. Listen, I have been one who's been super critical of NASCAR in the past for their decisions and specifically their inconsistencies in those decisions. But I think they deserve a ton of credit in this situation for not only how they ruled with Dillon, but for their three-race suspension of Dillon's spotter, Brandon Banesh, for his inflammatory remarks instructing the number three pilot to wreck Denny Hamlin on that final corner, and the $50,000 fine to Joey Logano for his burnout on pit road. Although if I'm being honest, I thought it might be a little higher for the Team Penske driver just because of the danger factor. So kudos to NASCAR for those rulings and getting it right. That being said, I really hope they work on improving the timing of those decisions in the future. It's a bang-bang call, I get it, but that's their job. They're no different than the NFL, NBA, or any other major sport. Make a judgment on the spot, and then if you have to alter or amend it later, so be it. I really think if they do that in the future and make those tough calls immediately, fans will A, appreciate it, and B, respect them even more. And finally, our last story is related to that final lap at Richmond, but we're going to focus specifically on what happened with Denny Hamlin. That's because Hamlin's crew chief, Chris Gabehart, made an appearance on Sirius XM NASCAR radio yesterday and talked about the race. He agreed with the penalties and also talked about how he hoped that NASCAR would be more prompt in their decision-making going forward. But I think the most interesting and frightening thing Gabe Hart said was about the violence of the impact for the number 11 car when it slammed into the wall. Every time you have a significant enough incident that, um, you know, warrants a further look into the incident data recorder, NASCAR will send you the data for that incident. JGR has had 21 of those instances in the Gen 7 era. 21 times we've gotten data from a crash from one of our four cars. Do you want to know what the highest recorded G spike in the history of Gen 7 was for JGR? It was Richmond in the 11 car. 32 G. Saturday, Sunday night, this past Sunday night. So, Sunday night, 32 wow. G spike in the wall off of turn four. Coming to the checker flag, highest ever recorded. I might add higher than the one that unfortunately put Kurt Busch out of, put him in retirement ultimately at Pocono. Higher than that. Did you hear that? The highest ever recorded for JGR and even higher than what happened with Kurt Busch that sent him into retirement. When Gabe Hart said those remarks about a 32G spike, if I'm being honest, the first thing that came to mind wasn't Bush at Pocono. I actually didn't think so much about what happened with Bush, but instead I thought about what happened with Hamlin last year at Charlotte. When you look at that crash, it was extremely violent and at a higher speed. I also know that Hamlin talked about having an injured foot after that crash. So the fact that it was the highest of the 21 incidents in the Gen 7 era at JGR was both surprising and alarming. Everyone is happy that Hamlin walked away uninjured. I mean, he gave his post-race press conference, and clearly he wasn't affected by it. So that speaks to the safety of these cars. I know the cars have received a bad rap over the last several years, and deservedly so, with the rear impacts that took out Bush and sideline Alex Bowman for, I think, five races with concussion issues. 
So they've addressed those issues. And in this big impact of 32 G's with Hamlin, he walked away uninjured and thankfully so. To be honest, when I hear that number and understand the severity and violence of that impact, I'm actually kind of surprised that in addition to the big penalty for Dylan, which there's no denying it was a big penalty, I'm surprised NASCAR didn't also suspend him for the right rear hook as they did in the past, last year to Elliott after what he did with Hamlin at Charlotte, and the year before to Bubba Wallace after what he did to Kyle Larson in Las Vegas. I guess NASCAR saw the removal of points and taking away his playoff eligibility as sufficient enough. All right, guys, that's a wrap on this episode. I want to get your thoughts on all of it. Let's start with the penalty of Dylan. Agree or disagree? And what about the penalties of Dylan Spotter and for Joey Logano? Did NASCAR get those right? And what about the JGR cars and their recent engine failures four times in the last nine races? If you're a JGR fan, are you concerned as we head down the stretch toward the playoffs? And lastly, what do you think when you hear the 32G number and how that's the biggest hit by a JGR car in the Gen 7 era? Thanks as always for supporting the channel and I hope you have a great rest of your day.